Okay, so I'm Nick Susanis. I did what, uh, I'm a postdoc here for another few weeks, um, and I did what's probably the first doctorate in comic book form in North America um, as a student at Columbia's Teachers College. Uh, and so my plan today is to tell you just a little bit about that, a little bit about how I use comics and think about them and why I think this is all important. Um, and to start, this is a bit of a strange screen, um, but to start, I just want to say a little bit about my own background. I was a comics maker as a kid, so I didn't just show up at Columbia and say, I'm going to make comics. Um, and I made, produced my own character through high school and who makes a reappearance in my chapter on imagination in the dissertation now book. Um, but I stopped. I, I, I mean, I made him in the background for a long time, but once I got to undergrad, you know, if you're an act, if you're sort of want to do scholarly intellectual things, comics didn't fit the bill for that. So I kept making them in the background, but I studied mathematics as a student. Um, and it, it's at a time where comics didn't have that. So it's really interesting to me to see us come from that time to this great change where you can do your doctorate in comics form. I teach courses to students who then teach comics to their students. Um, so we've, we've made a great change. And for me, that rediscovery, I was in Detroit doing arts, arts uh, writing and arts curating. Um, and I, I got invited to be in a political art show, and I turned back to comics because I had very little time. And I found the work I could do through visual metaphor and verbal metaphor was a way that I could really reach across divisions and really a way that I could, I could connect to people. And I did this later when we put on a show on games and art. Um, and so it's a history and philosophy of games um, in comics form. And I found that I could do this incredibly complex stuff without dumbing it down, but make it accessible. And so when I came to, to, when I came to school, I said, this is the kind of stuff I want to do. So I didn't surprise them with it. I, they admitted me on the basis of I was going to make comic books and they would have to learn it. So the minute I got there, I started making comics as my work. So that I had the good fortune to have Maxine Green. Uh, is anybody aware of philosopher? Of, uh, I have arts-based people in the room. Of course they know this. But if you don't, Max, what's that? Education-based. Education-based. But well, if you, anyway, so Max, I, I had a class with Maxine in her living room, and she then served on my committee for until she passed six weeks after my defense, which was in her living room. Um, she was amazing. So you, I have some comics on Maxine on my website, which you're welcome to check out. Um, so that, from the very start, I made comics as my work. This was a, cha a chapter in my advisor, Ruth Vin's book on uh, narrative research. And she handed me the last chapter and said, do what you want with it. Um, so I sort of made the case for it before I even started the dissertation. Like, I showed them that this could be done. And so I just want to take you through a little bit of unflattening. The, and get a sense of it, because it's, both its subject and its form sort of speak to each other. Um, and so by unflattening, I was sort of countering flatness. And flatness was not a literal sort of thing, but a, a state of mind, a lack of a critical dimension, where we sort of are stuck in a place um, where we forget what might be and stuck in how it is. And I liken that because I already had the word unflattening um, to flatland. And I'm guessing some of you are familiar with Edwin Abbott's flatland. If, if you're not, it doesn't really matter. Um, it, it's the story of the geometrical inhabitants of this uh, infinite two-dimensional world. And they can move east and west and southwards and northwards, but not upwards. They have no concept of anything off the plane. And we can sort of look down at that and say, that's kind of ridiculous. But I think, you know, what is upwards to you and I? What are the dimensions we can't step? What are the directions we can't look into because we can't see that way? We don't even, it's not, it's outside of our perception. And I think, at least in the States, the institution of education, which I was in the school of, um, was very, is very much responsible for fostering a kind of flatness. Um, I think very much in, unintentionally, but it's education as a series of steps, education as recipe. Um, where, where you know, uh, your learning is, is put into boxes, whether it's boxes of subject or boxes of time or the boxes of space, like this room. And I think we end up taking those boxes into ourselves and thinking that they're real. So somebody who studied mathematics and studied art is looked at as sort of odd. And I think that's really an artifice of the, the boxes that we draw around ourselves. And so it's sort of a pushback against getting lined up and specifically getting into these rows and rows of text, 12-point font, double-spaced, one-and-a-half by one by one by one margin, 
Why are we stuck with that? Um, not to say that it's not good, but to say, why is this the way it is? And we can look as far back as Plato, who called images shadows of shadows. And we can look at Descartes, who distrusted the senses altogether and wanted us to be thinking machines. But it's something that we still have with us. Um, so I look here, I may not, um, you know, we, we can think about text as very much a linear thing. One word is, is connected to the next, is chained to the next, is connected to the next. Whereas pictures unfold in a much more, you know, connected and all over sort of way. And so you can think about any time you try to, to represent the complexity of your experience, you have to flatten it out. So I have, it's like taking the globe, I smush it down, I'm going to make distortions, I'm going to leave things out. So if you look at the middle part there, where it's uh, Buckminster Fuller's Dimaxium map, he puts it on an icosahedron first, and then unfurls it. And where the, the, the Mercator projection above shows separations, his map shows connections. That doesn't make it more correct. It just makes it a different kind of mapping, a different kind of flattening. And so it's like anything. We ask, if you ask me the temperature, or if you ask me the weather, and all I tell you is the temperature, that doesn't help you much in Calgary in particular. Because if it's sunny out, it feels like it's summer. And if it's not sunny out, it's winter. So if you don't tell me the wind, if you don't tell me the cloud cover, et cetera, you're leaving, everything you code for, you're leaving out other, other ways of knowing. And so that's the, sort of the big question is, what are we leaving out? What are we not seeing? And what might we start to make visible when we bring in these other ways of knowing? And I have this, because I, I talk very much about ways of seeing. And I, I didn't mean it quite so literally. I mean ways, I do also because I'm talking about comic books and visual thinking. But I also mean ways of, of seeing as ways of knowing. So I put in the example of my dog. Um, and so you guys all know that the dog's sense of smell is stronger than yours and mine. But what's really important about the dog's sense of smell is that it's more nuanced, which means the dog comes into this room and knows who was at this table this morning, who was here yesterday afternoon, who gave a talk yesterday morning, and so on, maybe as far back as seven days. And so they have access to layers of time that we simply can't, so kind of upwards. Um, and I think those are the kinds of things we need to think about when we think about education. And so unflattening became this really simple idea. Um, you know, each eye is giving you two different pieces of information. And we don't think about this because you live with it all the time. But, um, but there's no correct view there. It's that those two have to get along. And I think about that as a kind of displacement. You know, to get outside of your own perspective, you want to be able to look from another vantage point at the same time. And that allows you to see that, you know, not see things head on and see that they have sides, be able to turn them around, turn them over, open them up. And it doesn't have to stop at two, obviously. And so for me, comics were not only this thing that I loved to do because I was a comics maker, but they're also this way to be amphibious, breathe in the worlds of image and text, and maybe get at some of the boundaries of my own thinking and some of the places I'm stuck, and maybe find ways to step out. Um, and just you know, try to find new ways of thinking. So I want to talk a little bit about the form itself, how comics do their thing. And um, I think one of the key things to think about comics, I think you know, we're in this point where it's very exciting. Comics are seen as this new thing. But I think, really, this is a very old form. And, and even more than that, it's part of a lineage of us trying to figure out our world through pictures that's as long as we've been human. And I think that's a really a vital point to think when we talk about literacies, like why have we left this, why have we not included this? Why have we said this counts and other things don't? And so comics, is, have any of you guys seen Scott McCloud's book, Understanding Comics? A few nodded heads. If you want to teach comics, this is a great place to start. Um, and Scott, he sort of liberated comics from genre things by, not that he wasn't alone in that, but his, his comic book about comic books really talks about it as a broader art form. And his definition, juxtapose pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence, basically says, if I put my fist here and I draw a box around it, and then I put my fist here and draw another box around it, you guys all make the action happen. Comics are a static medium. Nothing moves. But the reader, the reader is always uh, dreaming up the action between the panels. It's always create, they're animating it themselves. So in some sense, sure, comics are sequential like text is. So you read left to right, top to bottom. But at the same time, because they're visual, you can't help but make connections from the lower right back up to the upper left. And in fact, you can make connections within the panel. Like, you know, do you read the text box first, or do you read the image first? Um, and actually, that's a question for you. What do you guys do first when you read a comic book? Do you read the words first or the pictures? Pictures. pictures. 
Everyone reads the pictures first? I don't believe. Depends on the page. Depends on the page. Yeah. Depends on the comic too. Yeah. So, so I mean, the fact that you have all these choice, you know, the comic comes with this, you know, these the fancy word rhizomatic choices. Like there is no the hierarchy that is uh, of text is sort of shattered here. And to me, that's where comics get really exciting because we think about how we we think. You know, you guys are you're coming from this event and you're going to another thing. There's sort of the linear path of your day, but at the same time, you know, any things we've talked about right now are triggering thoughts of things in the past and they're triggering thoughts of things in the future. So even as you're sort of moving sequentially through time, your, your thoughts are going uh, sideways. And I think comics do this really neat thing where they allow you to be, you know, catch the sequential linear activity, but also have the tangents in the ways that your mind works. So I have a couple examples from comics that do this sequential simultaneity at the same time. So this is a, this is a, a French comic about the Louvre. Um, and, you know, yes, I could cut this up into nine panels and you could read it, I think a slideshow, but you would miss that greater image that's going on when you see the whole. Mm -hmm. And it's significant to the meaning of this, obviously, if you know the Louvre. This one, pretty hard to see this slide, sorry. Um, but you see this, this gasoline alley from the 1930s. You see this character sort of bumbling along sequentially through what is actually one scene. So even though he's you know, he's got sequence, that whole page is one simultaneous event. And then this one's a joke, so when you've got it. So the only way this little guy can get the fruit is that time and space is mashed together in comics in a different sort of way. And I think the, the narrative potential is the information presenting uh, potential is really in this mashup of sequential and simultaneous. Um, in this example, this is from the dissertation book again. Um, this is talking about my wife's commute in Manhattan. And I'm sort of contrasting. She had this very different pattern of moving every day. She went to different places and different, different orders each day. And um, I was contrasting that with the regular commute. And I could have like, illustrated by saying, here's on one hand, there's this, and here's this. But I really want to find ways, rather than illustrating, to embody the work. So the grid in the background, um, and I'm sorry, this is so squat looking. Um, but the grid in the background has that out and back, and it's this repetitive thing. It's repeated in the very structure of the page. And I'd noticed the coincidence of Manhattan shape with like a drifting, with a leaf or a feather falling. And I, this also talks about the derive, the French situationist thing, uh, the drifting. So that her commute is sort of a drifting through New York and allowed her to see different things than you would if you were just going out and back. So the whole page can take on that shape. And so that, that raises this question for me is, what, what do our thoughts look like? And since we're small enough here, you know, can you guys want to answer that question? Can you say what your thoughts look like before you put them out in the world? In your head, you know, I don't know, even in your head. What do you, anybody want to brave an answer? There's eight of us in the room or something. What do your thoughts look like before you say them, before you write them, before you draw them? Any guess? Spaghetti? Somebody said spaghetti to me once, and that stuck with me. Do they look like rows and rows of text? Some of them do. Some of them do. You have lines of text, or you have some lines of text mixed in with, mixed in with what, Anne? To put you on the spot. I don't know. Colors. Mixed in with colors. Anybody else want to jump in? I would equate it to like northern lights. Northern lights. I like that. Nice. This is the universe. I feel like I'm kind of doing this. You're kind of doing that. I'm seeing all the stars. stars. Yeah. So we've, you know, so there's maybe some moments where things are somewhat linear, and there's moments where things are all over. And so to me, not to, I mean, you know, I'm cherry picking my answer here, but um, I think comics do that so well because they allow you to, you know, there are sequential moments, but there are also this ability to have many things going at once. If you're not familiar with Chris, uh, contemporary cartoonist Chris Ware's work, um, I think he does a phenomenal job of moving between the sequential and the tangential and, and, and really talking about how our memories work in that sort of fragmented way. Um, so for me, comics were this great way to represent the complexity of our thoughts, and that was a big part of the work. But I think what's come out of it, and is certainly a huge part of my teaching, is that they're also a really vital way to generate our thoughts, the act of making. Um, 
And so, you know, you know, your eyes at every second are darting about three times a second, and they're figuring out relationships. So the minute you make a mark on a flat piece of paper, your eyes go to work trying to interpret that, and they start to see things that you didn't mean. They start to, to, start to generate ideas. And so for me, I, I say often that my comics were, are, are smarter than I am, and it's not to be funny at all. It's to say that in working in this medium, to have the visual interact with my other ways of thinking gave me this great partner to, that I had a feedback relationship with. So I sketch, and the sketches generate ideas for me. And that back and forth, you know, I realize I have arts-based researchers in here, so that's an easy thing to say. But um, um, I really changed the work. So this is not a work where I wrote a bunch of text and then I decided what pictures to go with it. Had I done that, it would have been a very different thing altogether. Um, and I get that question all the time. What do you start with first, you know, words or pictures? And I say, yes. Um, and it's very much true. It's, it's this dance between the two and, and, the, and the ideas. Um, and I, I was really happy Harvard let me reproduce a bunch of the sketches in the back of the book. This was the very first um, sort of draft sketch of where I was going. And um, I, I think it's important for two reasons. Uh, I mean, it's interesting for me because I can see what made it and what didn't make it three years later. But it's also, for people who don't draw, I think finished work or don't make music or don't do whatever, um, it looks like magic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think seeing the sort of messiness that, that is our thinking, and I think that's the other important thing, is that this is my thinking. This isn't like me writing down my thinking. This is where the thinking happens, through the tool, through the paper. Um, and I think people seeing both of those sides of it really sees that as something that they can do themselves. Um, and so I'm going to give you one more example from the book itself, um, how it was generated, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so I have a chapter on imagination, and, and in that I wanted to talk about the transformative power of stories. And so very early on I had the thought, I'll do something with Scheherazade and the Knight's Tales and the story within story within story. And uh, as I started it, um, and it's not quite in this order, but, uh, but I had the idea, do you know the book Zoom where there's a... Like there, there's a postcard, and then you zoom in on the postcard, and they're watching TV in it. And then you, it's a kid's book, but it's this, it keeps diving in deeper and deeper, and you never know what's real. And there's also The Powers of Ten by the Eames, the film and the book where they go in a power of ten closer. So I wanted to sort of play with that idea of zoom, so stories within stories, either literal or metaphorical. And as I got through it, uh, the middle of the page, I wanted to say by stories, I don't just mean the fanciful, but I also mean things like science. And so if I was writing, I would have probably just said, and by stories, I also mean things like science, period. Um, but here, I needed to find something that didn't illustrate it, but embodied it through the visuals, embodied it through the very form of the page itself. Um, and so I was like, well, what should I do? You know, what, what in science makes sense here? And so since this is sort of set in the the time that the Knight's Tales were wrote, written down and the place they were written down, I started looking into what's going on in science there. And I hit upon uh, the work of a man named Altusi, whose astronomical uh, observations and, and calculations were picked up 300 years later and mostly uncredited by Copernicus to do his, you know, uh, shatter, uh, his revolutionary idea. And I got all excited. I was like, that's perfect, because I already had this page about Copernicus early on which the key of it is nothing changed except the point of view which changed everything. I was like, this is, this is it. So I spent a couple weeks on this little part of this page trying to learn the astronomy well enough that I could you know, make use of it within the context of my thing, explain it well enough so people got it and its significance, and make it visually work. I had to keep my schema of zooms working through the whole thing. Um, and so you can kind of see where I figured it out. And here's the final page, and it's those three panels in the lower left, um, which we can blow up. Well, you can see it here. But you can see it a little closer. Um, and so the, the point here is that there's no reason, there's nothing in my notes that says, you should go research 13th century Arab astronomy. Uh, it's not part of my, I don't, nothing, except that the drawings ask me to go do that work. And I think the real point of this is, is when we think about you know, when we think about education, when we think about learning, um, you know, when you open those spaces, when you bring those other modes on, rather than it becoming filling a space, it becomes a journey. And I think you know, I don't I don't know how many people enjoyed doing their dissertation. Um, you can ask that question later, I guess. But I did. Um, I loved it, and it's not because it was easy. It was harder than it would it needed to be. 
but it took me in all these places I didn't expect. And I think that's, you know, I think that's our goal as educators is to have people find the ways they need to go and that they can discover to go. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you and um, take any questions you want to take.